This is 91.3 FM, WCW in Worcester, Massachusetts, the Dr. Chris Radio of Horror program. Tonight on Radio Horror, we have a special in-studio guest from Rock and Shock, which I just got done doing. Thanks to Kevin and Gina for putting on another fabulous show. Joining for me for an interview is my friend Cordelia, and we're interviewing author Jack Ketchum for the first time live, still recorded though, but live in person in the studio here at the WCW building. Thank you for coming on the show with us, Jack. My pleasure. It's uh, Jack is, for anyone for first tuning into Radio Horror or has tuned in before but haven't heard Jack's interviews, Jack has been on the show almost every year I've done Radio Horror, uh, only skipping like a year here or there, and it is a, a true honor to have him in the studio with us. I'm a recidivist. Yes. <laughs> Jack, what are you working on right now? It was 35 years ago that I published my first book called Off Season, and they're doing a, a 35th anniversary edition of it. That's cool. So what I'm working on is a short story in the in the um, in the world of off season, a new one and an, f- an afterward to the to that book. So that's what I when I go home, that's what I'm working on next. Wow, that's yeah. really cool. Yeah, it should be fun. And off season has other uh, books connected to it. Yeah, ten years after I wrote off season, I wrote Offspring because I had I thought it was well, I it shouldn't be any real. Um, uh, surprised anybody who's read off uh, off season. I kill off all the cannibals at the end of off season. Yes, and then ten years ago, I had another idea for a uh, a, 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 a plot that would work with the cannibals on the coast of Maine. And so I said, oh, well, maybe one of them didn't quite die." So I resurrected one of the cannibals uh, and and just wrote another book called Offspring. And then about 10 years after that, I, I, I did uh, The Woman. So there's three. Okay. But I cheated in all of them because at the end of each book, they're all dead, but then they get resurrected. So, so this is the fourth, the, the fourth story within this universe. Uh, fourth story, if you, encounter, if, you, if, you, if you count a story called Winter Child, which is a novella. Uh, actually, there's four novels, uh, three novels and, and one novella. And uh, just for anyone listening who, who's not familiar with what, what a novella is. A novella is almost anything you want it to be that's not as short as a short story and as long as a big doorstop novel. In the old days, James M. Cain and, and uh, Dashiell Hammett would have been considering writing novellas because they were writing things that are about 180 pages long, 190 pages long. Nowadays, you can't really publish too many novels at that length. Uh, they're looking for doorstops, bigger books. Uh, so uh, the novella runs from, I'd say, oh, say 50 to 60 pages up to 100 and, and maybe 30 or 40. I'm curious. Um, I know that you were working on a sequel to The Woman with Lucky McKee. Um, what's up with that? Is there going to be a novelization also? or? Well, the thing is, we were thinking about doing a, a new movie based on, on The Woman, and that was some years ago. Mm-hmm. And it sort of just lay fallow. Uh, then Pollyanna McIntosh, who plays the woman, who's a brilliant actress and is really ferocious in the movie, she and the producers got together and they said, well, let's do another one. And she's devising a script for it. I don't really have anything to do with that except to advise her on the script. We'll see how that goes. Excellent. Yeah. The uh, I had a chance to uh, talk with uh, Lucky McGee. Uh, he was doing uh, All Cheerleaders Die. Did you get a chance to see mm-hmm, that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've Good ne- fun. Yeah, I've never seen the original though. I didn't realize till after the interview. He, he was won't based show on a me remake. the goddamn original. I don't know why. I mean, I keep on asking him to let me see the the original one, but I. Uh, he, he well, isn't it available somewhere? Probably. I mean, he's got tapes of it. It's but it's just, it was a student film, and I think you know. Oh you know, wait, is it a movie he did? Huh? Wait, is it a remake of a of a student film that he did? Or no, I don't. I don't I'm not understanding. All Children's Die was the first thing that he and Chris Siverson did right out of college. Oh, okay. So that I didn't. Okay, yeah, now I'm. Okay, yeah. now that makes more sense. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Okay. So, but so no one's really kind of seen it then. Very limited distribution. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I guess I mean you're remaking your own thing is that really a remake or is it just making it better with a budget? Update. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know because I didn't see the original, but the, but all Cheerleaders die is a lot of fun. It's yeah, just, no, yeah. I thought it was a uh, you know what it's uh, it, it's 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 smart. It's not it's not your basic. It, it's not what the the title sounds like. No, it's a lot smarter than that. Exactly. Yeah. What is why is it cannibalism just so popular? You know, and again, and you write a lot of books about cannibalism, and of course the Green Inferno is out now. And, 
you know, is cannibalism going to become the new cannibals going to become the new vampire werewolf nah, and witch? No, nah, I think we're stuck with zombies on that one. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Did you? Uh, what have you seen uh, lately that you've really enjoyed in the horror community? Film. Yes, film. We'll go, do we do film and then we'll do a book because I would love to hear what your some of your best uh, stuff that you've uh, maybe watched and absorbed. That's a tough question because I haven't liked, I haven't really loved anything. Recently. But what is something you may have hated, but you can explain? Why. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Yeah, and of course you were. I mean, I I, I must say I did not like uh, the the Green Inferno. You didn't? No, I didn't. We I, saw I that in dis- theaters. I was we disappointed. Was, oh, yeah. Uh, some really silly plot holes and. Excuse me, what the fuck was that costume she's wearing at the end? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck was that? Uh, it, Ritual it covers up, Yeah, it covers up all the spots. Yeah. And her hair is covering... So it, it looked like an old, like, Raquel Welsh movie. It was <laughs> bizarre. Um, no, I, I, you got to go back to the original stuff. you got to go back to, you know, um, um, uh, the, the Italian movies to get that right. Uh, Ferox yeah. and Holocaust yeah, exactly. and all yeah. of those. Yeah. Uh, Hill of the Cannibal Gods. Yeah. That, that, yeah. Is that a film? Yeah. yeah. Well, that was, wasn't that Ursula Andress or something? Ursula Andress, yeah. yeah. And it was do- in Dr. No, right? She's she like, was, to, she, she comes yeah. out of the sea and breaks everybody's heart. In the iconic swimsuit. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. Right, okay, yeah. yes, and it is. And then there's What's New Andress. Pussycat. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, she had, she had a fun, silly career. She was married to this guy, John Derrick, who was a photographer, who I guess married Linda Evans after that. He kept on marrying the same woman. It was the Mountain yeah. of the Cannibal Gods, and she was in She, also another horror that's movie. Right. Oh, that's she. right. Yes. H. And R- she, yeah, H. Ryder Haggard. Kind of, you disappeared a little bit last year because um, mm-hmm. you had uh, you had cancer. Yeah, I did. Uh, what type of cancer was it? Uh, th- throat and and uh, neck cancer. I was treated f- uh, with. Um, I didn't have surgery. I had uh, chemo and radiation therapy for about three months. I had this fun. Japanese woman doctor. Her name was Dr. Lee, and she's about oh five foot something. Mm-hmm. And the last time I saw her, which is pretty recently, she said, she said, she looked at my mouth and she said, "I said I'd kill you. I kill you. Go away." <laughs> so I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So it's it's gone. It's 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 done. Did you? Have but it? I did lose. I lost forty five pounds. Oh, I was down to a hundred pounds. Oh my God! There are photographs that was taken by me uh, for me by a friend of mine named Harry Glazer, who's a good photographer. I said, "You've got to take nudes of me because I want to remember what this shit looked like, <laughs> and nobody will ever see them but me and Harry." But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's pretty scary. I looked like something out of a uh, you know Holocaust film. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'm glad you were you were you can you can say you beat cancer. Thank that's, you, sir. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. that's something Absolutely. really not yeah. easy to do. Yeah. Did you get any writing done while you were laid up in bed? I did. It was it was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the best stories come to you while you're near death. Well, Lucky and I were writing a, a new book and a new movie called Healer. Okay. Which we completed during that period of time, and uh, as we usually do, Lucky does the hard the hard work on the screenplay, and I do the hard work on the on the prose, and we trade them back and forth and swap it and say, you know, okay, change this, do that, whatever. But um, I, I I finished up finding with the prose, and and I looked back and I went, oh my god. The first four chapters don't work at all there because I was sick and I didn't particularly know what I was writing at the time. Uh, and then I would look back and I said, Oh, here's a main character. Um, at one point, say chapter five, his parents are lower middle class. In chapter 20, they're upper middle class. You got to fix that shit and make it work. But I did, went through it all, and uh, I think we got a good book out of it. Um, the woman I live with, Paula White, gave me her highest compliment. She said, I like it. That's Paula. I sent it to Stephen King, and he gave me a really nice blur about it. He liked it a lot. So we're, we're marketing that now and trying to find a good home for it. So, But uh, that's that's what I was writing during all the period of time. I wrote almost every day. Oh, that's good. It helps a lot. Yeah, I mean, it that's fantastic. It keeps you focused. Ex- yeah. And off your mind, off of just, Yeah, exactly. You know, off, like the bull- the, off the bullshit. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, th- did did either of you see Lucky's seg- uh, Tales of Halloween? Lucky has a segment in that. I saw a rough cut of it. I yeah. liked it. Yeah. It's only yeah. just out now, I think, in theaters, so I haven't seen it yet. Oh, but they're yeah. going to do that next weekend. I just saw the rough cut of that segment, so I haven't seen the entire film. W- one of the best uh, Halloween <coughs> uh, horror movies that nothing to do with like Michael Myers that have to do with the holiday itself since like, Trick or Treat. You know? And yeah. there hasn't been like a lot, or the ones that have come out have been kind of blah. 
yeah. you know. But this and Trick or Treat are are fantastic. And if you've ever if you've never seen uh, uh, the house that October built, that has been mm-hmm. phenomenal. No, I've, seen, I've never seen that. It's about these. Um, uh, recommend buying the Try and Hunt Down the Blu-ray that came out from Best Buy yeah. because you get the original documentary that they made as like as a student film, and then they got um, distribution because they saw the student film to remake their movie mm-hmm. as an actual with with a budget. And it's about these uh, these these filmmakers who are documenting uh, Halloween horror hounds, and they discover one kind of underground that um, is run by serial killers. Oh. Well, sounds yeah, interesting. It's very creepy. Right. It's, okay. it's pretty tasty. Cool. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, good. highly recommend checking it out. But yes, uh, Cordelia, definitely see Tales of Halloween. So good. Um, the, I think John Skip has a segment in that too, doesn't he? Yes, like he, he does. Wrote, okay. Yes. Ah, uh, Mr. Skip. <laughs> yes, and John Landis has a great part in it too. And huh. the American vampire from Being Human mm-hmm. is in it, and he has a he has he's on like like a like a comedy segment inside it because the, there there are some ones that are really like <gasps> Jesus Christ like uh. Lynn Shay's one even though she's not involved with the main plot she's kind of the storyteller of this Halloween tale that yeah. the main character goes off to have the shit moment that makes you just jump when it happens <laughs> that's really great uh, there's a lot of different like horror icons in it and the, like, t- like Ty West has a segment in it as well okay. and, and so on and so forth great stuff. Um, what's funny is that when they're doing this these days is that when they send people like me, a media person, a copy of a screener that they don't want, obviously, me to cut and bootleg out to the Chinese on the Internet, right. they stick my name, my email address, my phone number, the ah. name of my show in front of the screen. So it's kind of like you're trying to watch it through like wording, like very light gray wording on a screen. <laughs> But if I decided to do that, it's like encoded it's in the master. <laughs> no, it's just to let them know that if I tried to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. my yeah. name is all. My, my personal information is all over my screener copy, which is, I think, very smart. You got to protect it. Yeah. yeah. Sure. But I was just sitting there looking at it, like, Jesus Christ, this is difficult <laughs> to watch because I'm going to look through gray stuff on the screen. Actually, I, was, I had a statement, which was that I, I don't really fangirl all that often but when i saw you and uh john skip walking down the hallway at uh world horror this year <laughs> I, well, I had were a we fangirl. singing you were not singing because at the time. we do sing every now and then That's yeah. Fantastic. yeah john and i get we, we start singing i'm gonna put you on the spot shit. right now can you sing for us right here live what do you want to hear i don't care <laughs> <laughs> sudden you know suicide karaoke uh <laughs> suicide karaoke i don't know that tune <laughs> <laughs> if i found some lyrics on my phone could you sing them sure okay all right sure. continue with what you were asking right. i'm gonna find some lyrics for jack you've had a lot of big names who are big fans of your work is yeah. there anyone that's ever surprised you with their endorsement of your work uh, stephen king surprised me absolutely yeah um when I was I, I was doing Joyride, and Phil Nutman, the late Phil Nutman, the late lamented Phil Nutman, love you, Phil. He had just done a, a book, uh, and he had a, a piece in a book that Stephen had a piece in as well. And he got to meet Stephen, talk to him for a while, and he said, you know, when I, I was lamenting the fact that all my books were stuck in sort of forty thousand copy hell, couldn't get any more print run than that. And he said, well, you know, Steve King re- he reads books for breakfast. Maybe he, you know, send it to him. So between Phil and Paula, my lady friend, they got me to, to, to send him a funny letter basically saying, I'm stuck here. Can you know, give me a hand? Maybe, you know, whatever. I don't know if you know me at all. And he wrote me back and he said, yeah, I've read everything since off season. I loved your books. And I just went, oh, this is very cool. Oh, and he called me up. Hello, this is Steve King. Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> getting a call from the master <laughs> and yeah and he said you know whatever you want um he said I'll, I'll write you a quote i think he said i'll write you a quote that will make the blind see and the lame walk or something <laughs> like that and he did he wrote a great quote for joyride and then he wrote also a generic quote as well and so that was a total thrill because i've been reading him forever and you know he was that was that was a, a total kick in the ass yeah that's great yeah I'm still looking for some from some song for you to sing. Hold on, I got it. I'm still looking for a song. Wait, for you're you to picking sing. something. Yeah, I'm going to pick something. <laughs> <laughs> I want to want to hear Jack catch him sing. Oh, what's, Jesus. What's the last thing you sang? The last thing I sang. It's going to be really in cheesy, the bath, too, by the in way. In the bathtub or what? In the bathtub. <laughs> in know, the shower. Walking down the hall with with Mr. Skip. I mean. <laughs> 
All right. Oh, dear. I think Chris has a suggestion. <laughs> I have a song for you to sing now. Here we go. Um, I will spend my whole life through loving you, just loving you. Winter, summer, springtime, too. Loving you, loving you makes no difference where I go or what I do. You know that I'll always be loving you. Elvis. Yes. Beautiful. <laughs> awesome. We should have kidnapped him to go karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a bad idea, Chris. <laughs> You're going to really play that? <laughs> Jesus Christ. I better hear that before I... <laughs> uh, we in the car. We were he, having got me, he gave me a drink. You know, that's what... That's what oh, that's he <laughs> gave me a drink. <laughs> <laughs> this man is famous for having an entire liquor cabinet underneath his table at Rock and Shock. <laughs> One of the one of the first uh, books that I picked up of yours that uh, still resonates with me today, and then everyone I keep talking to uh, who I say uh, that you know do you recommend something, and I say oh this that, and I say oh you're a Jack Ketchum, and he's like what should I read? And I was like I, you should read the Girl Next Door, and they're like why? And I was like I don't want to tell you. I think you need <laughs> to read that book and then come back and let me know if you're still my friend. <laughs> and I accept people up for that book a lot because yeah. they they the first thing that pops in their head is the 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 movie about the porn star that moves next door to the high school kid, and he's yeah, like yeah. oh my god. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, the Girl Next Door is a title I think goes all the way back to like the 30s. Really? Yeah, I think it was like a musical called The Girl Next Door or something like that. So. And there was a recently a movie with Jennifer Lopez called The Boy Next Door. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Which I, as soon as I saw that, I was like, hey, I'm <laughs> thinking of Jack's book. <laughs> Do you think that is that your like your number one most well known novel? Uh, that and Off Season. Yeah. Yeah, Off Season I think was uh, my, my first book. It was pretty influential, I think. Um, I found out later. People keep on saying, "Well, you know, this changed things for me," and that's kind of neat to know. What, like, what has some fans come up and said to you at cons about the off season? Well, not just fans, but writers. Writers. Uh, they said, you know, th this is the first book that they were aware of that melded horror with procedural, with police procedural, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, it was the first, one of the first that didn't deal with horror as uh, supernatural at all. Mm -hmm. It was just what could possibly happen if you ran across the wrong group of people. <laughs> Uh, and it was it, it sort of partook of the uh, suspense kind of book, um, but it was much more visceral than that. It, it had much more bite. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think I, in that sense it was yeah. That, that those two are the the most um, uh, popular of mine for sure. How many of your movies have you have you been in? Because you seem to have cameos here and there. I've been in all of them, but uh, in in um, the woman I was basically you see my feet. He cut me out. <laughs> I, I thought like he was my fucking friend, you know. He, he, he cut me out basically. I'm carrying a dog and he cuts on my feet. Oh, but, but, uh, but yeah, I've I've done walk-ons in all of them. Yeah, and also in uh, Edward Lee's header, I played a cop in Edward Lee's header. I remember that was that. kind of that was fun because Lee Lee and I went up there together to do this, and and uh, Lee had never acted at all, and I hadn't for years. But we did this thing, and we nailed it. We got it, like, the first or second take. We just nailed it. And <clears throat> he said to me afterwards, do you think they'll cut us out? I said, Lee, we found a naked body in the forest. They can't cut us out. <laughs> you know, it was fun. I, uh... <clears throat> Um, I think it was like a couple of years ago I had mentioned you um, uh, this idea I had about compiling like a book about you know the movies based on your, your books mm. and you said oh you know to talk to Lucky he has a lot of great stories but don't ever talk about like Red because you said Red had a big he had a big production problem with that yeah and there's a lot of sour grapes with him about that well not anymore but at the time yeah it left a bad taste in his mouth he was he was taken off the the, the, uh, the film because of a dispute with the producer and the producer had the money and he didn't so he lost and so it was a uh, it was it was rough that sucks but yeah that's that's over oh okay good yeah. um i was going to ask since you've only written the one supernatural horror book and that was uh, she, she wakes, wakes yeah it it does seem like a lot of your horror is based around r encountering the wrong group of people under the wrong yeah. circumstances. Yeah, yeah. It seems like that's, I think that's one of the reasons that I'm as big a fan of your work as I am is because that's always the scariest thing to me is other people. Mm -hmm. Me too, me too. What we do to one another. Yep. The werewolf yeah. transformations that occur in people's mm -hmm. brains under the right circumstances. There are no nameless horrors in my books. <laughs> There's no Lovecraftian horror. Yep. No. 
one of the things I'm waiting for is uh, this all, all this anthology of female driven horror movie segments. Mm. XX. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Should be fun. Yeah, I'm okay. very excited about that one. Mm. Yeah. When what's the uh, what's the release date of that? Like 2016. I, I honestly don't know, but but uh, I saw I saw the segment. It's pretty good. Based on the box, I like it. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. haven't read the box. Can you talk a little bit about that? It's hard to talk about the box because the box is basically an enigma. Um, that's the, that's the appeal of it. It's my most published short story. It's been published and translated into various languages, and it's been taught in high school colleges. Wow! Yeah, uh, a guy is going back home from uh, the Christmas shopping with his with his three kids, a boy and two girls, and they're on a train, and the boy see, the, the boy sees a man sitting opposite him with a great big box, and he's curious as to what's in the box. What's in and the box? What's well, in the box? Well, yeah, and the boy and and the man opens the box and shows it. Only the boy doesn't show anybody else. And the boy looks at it and he gets a kind of curious look on his face, uh, sort of unusual look on his face. That's it. The guy gets off next stop, and and they go on to their stop in Rye, and and that's that's it. And the kids ask him, the sisters ask him, so what's in the box? He said nothing. And then the boy stops eating for no reason, seemingly whatsoever. He just not interested in food like he's not doesn't feel like eating at all and he never does again and it moves from there to the sisters and well i'm giving too much away mm. so the point is what the fuck was in the box i'll have to read it <laughs> what uh, what collection is it in peaceable that? kingdom okay first one yeah i gotcha the box is good uh-huh. Right to Life. Explain to the audience a little bit about what that is, because I'm, and it's based on a story mm-hmm. as well, a true story as well, which I'm not familiar with. Two true stories actually melded together. One was, um, it's fairly well known. It's it's a it's a, her, a woman's name is Colleen Stans. She was a young woman. She was abducted and kept in a box, and she kept she was kept in a box for a matter of years. Yikes. What I grafted that onto was a story I'd read. I, be, I believe in just a newspaper about. Uh, these this couple who had kidnapped a woman to bring her to term that was their motive for kidnapping her and, and keeping her in, in in their custody for however many months and I thought I'll put those two together and that might make an interesting story the the box has occurred more than once in your work too yeah boxes are interesting <laughs> <laughs> boxes and cannibals they close and you well, well, boxes, basements <laughs> they, yeah things that close you off that isolate you right. I, I I deal a lot in isolation uh, for me isolation is scary having only ever written the one s- a supernatural story do you just not want supernatural wanna, book I've supernatural other book s- other stories mm-hmm. stories but uh, have you ever wanted do you want to stay away from things that have just become kind of cliched and like overdone like we live in this world right now where zombies werewolves vampires and witches are everywhere and every five minutes mm-hmm. there's another story coming out even myself have, has a vampire story but uh, do you do you want to stay away from that is that why well, you sure don't? I do yeah I want I, I, I I want to thrill me. I want to scare me and thrill me. Okay. And I can't do that by doing the same old tropes all the time. True. Um, hell, even serial killers are overdone. Mm-hmm. You know, so so trying to find fresh ways to to reach um, the darker feelings that we have and that we're afraid of. Uh, that's sort of the goal: is to is to do it in different new ways and find different niches in your own heart and soul that scare the shit out of you. <clears throat> crack open the cryptozoology book and just pick a creature that hasn't had anything written about it that you can think of that was even good and just be like we're gonna do it about that or you know maybe do the the wheelchair bound handicap killer or something that's something you know no one says done before they've but done like this type of killer and this type of killer there, I, just did a piece, I just pe- did a piece on alzheimer's you know that scares the shit out of me so I, you know that's that was uh, uh, ripe for horror. Oh yeah. wow! Yeah. Has anyone ever come to you want to write a? Uh, uh, maybe maybe it's happened. I just not aware. A comic book. I mean, comic books have kind well, of resurgence over the last years. They did a comic of the box. They did. Yeah, okay. a comic version of the box. Yeah, I, I've been asked about it, but nothing has really been solid or or come through. I'd, I'd do it in a minute. I, I think it'd be fun to do. At one point, uh, there was a uh, an urge, or I don't know who who got this in their minds, but. Someone wanted to do The Girl Next Door as a comic. And there were actually drafts done of it, and they mm-hmm. just didn't work. So I I didn't go through with that. That would be okay, but I think definitely like Offspring, you know, Offseason off 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 would be better because it's, it's more action-oriented. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah The Girl Next Door is too quiet. True, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, 
I, I think you get enough of the visual from the movie. And yeah. I'm doing it as a comic book, I'm not sure. Because a lot of times comic books based on adaptations, you know, they say you can get away with more things than, than a movie can. But you, the movie adaptation of Girl Next Door is... Pretty um, much said it all. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. When these films get made based on your movie, as a writer, how much input do you are you allowed and do you get involved with it? It depends on the movie. In, in The Woman, I was there all the time because Lucky and I wrote it together and, and, and then... I was there for the entire shoot except for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Uh, So when something needed to be changed, we changed it right on the spot. Um, Weather or whatever, you know, we we just rewrote. Uh, So that was very intense. With uh, Girl Next Door, they were shooting it in New York mostly and in New Jersey. So I was there and I could, uh, that's my home turf. So I did a lot of, uh, I spent a lot of time on that set. But I've had input on all of them. Uh, to varying degrees, which is neat. They've always people have always consulted me. You know, do you think this is right? Which is pretty cool and unusual, I think. Like they come to you and say, "Do we want this actress to play like uh, like well, Bly- like with, Bl- Blythe?" Uh, that's the name of the main. Well, character no, they're never asking casting, which is good. Uh, okay, I, I don't want to deal with that. But but um, for instance, with with the Lost, uh, Chris Stevenson developed a script, and his original script is like 200 pages long. Wow! Because he included the cat. And he wanted the cat in. I thought, that's wonderful, because that's cat's a major thing in the book. But when I was reading it, I said, Chris, first of all, you're really low budget here. You've got to have a cat wrangler. You've got to have a bird wrangler. You've got to have a dog wrangler. And it's taken up a lot of space in the script. So maybe you should just dump the cat? And he said, oh, all right. But here I am saying, you know, cut a piece of, major piece of my book out because mm-hmm. it made the, the film better. So we, that script went back and forth at two or three times. Uh, and he was great about saying, you know, you know, thank you. I like this, and we'll just mess with it. The uh, the the convention that we just did, uh, Rock and Shock. Uh, do you? What's your next convention you going to? Well, actually, I leave here, and then I'm going up to Denver, to the Stanley Hotel. <gasps> yeah. Oh, Stephen very King territory. Cool. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's they're having a Halloween party out there. Oh. And it's not really a convention. I think it's just a small group of people. Yeah. But colonizing I'm that hotel with it. for that period of time. It'll be a week, five days. And I'm looking forward to that. It's Maybe it gets snowed fun. in. and That would be interesting. <laughs> do they have, like, activities that interact they with, do. like, the movie? They, they do, stuff yeah. Like that? Evidently, they just planted a hedge. Because they didn't have a hedge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard that the hedge was a entire yeah. studio set that yeah, they had yeah, to re- yeah, rebuild exactly, exactly. with a but snow they, machine pumping the snow but out. But they now evidently actually have a hedge, so we'll see. Did you read Doctor Sleep? Yeah, I liked it. You did? Okay. I, did, I know yeah. some people who were kind of hit or miss on it, and I, I thought it was... I, I, I just... The first chapter of it... It's a hard it, act to follow. Oh, well, yeah, so but a lot of people also... Pro- the problem with Doctor Sleep is that people don't read, and they watch <laughs> the movie, and then they bought Doctor Sleep, oh, and they yeah. were like... I don't understand. Certain things don't make sense. And I'm like, did you read the book? Yeah, and they're like, no. They're, they're, Why is the groundskeeper the, still alive? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I enjoyed it. I but that first chapter, first couple few chapters, whatever, it was really kind of, I was like, whoo, like when he's still a kid before mm-hmm. they transport to the future and he's mm-hmm. an adult now, whatever. I was just like, oh, my God, I'm reading this while I'm eating breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I kind of hope they make that into a movie. That'd but nice. I, yeah, again, how are they going to do it, make it into a movie if everyone's going to watch Stanley Kubrick's film and then go, well, everything's different compared to how the movie begins. I mean, are they gonna, not going to have, like, again, I forgot the name of the groundskeeper, but, uh, you know, Scott. I mean, Crowther's character. How in the world would anybody try to remake a, a, or do a sequel to a Stanley Kubrick movie? It's a ridiculous <laughs> True, idea. you know. So, you know, and, and, and neither Stephen nor I like that movie very much. No. Yeah. yeah, that's why he remade it for TV. Yeah. 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 But, uh, you know, I could see it being done. Sure, why not? That's cool. But they had that that the whole hell thing. Yeah, well, if, if I can get there. away with killing off all, all of my cannibals and then resurrecting for another movie... <laughs> can get away with that sure go into um certain parts of the the country or travel a little bit to get new inspiration to write things and based on to come up with new ideas i don't do it on purpose but i i do find that i'll go someplace i've never been before and oh there's a story idea there's yeah yeah what's one example of, of one? Oh shit what bar was i in last <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, this, this stuff comes all over the place. I, I eavesdrop on the street and I'll get ideas. Would so you write a story about, <coughs> like, a, a a thriller about, like, a cancer survivor and, and related to what you went through? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't shy away from that. I've, I've actually touched on that in a couple of short stories, but not, not in a, a book-length thing. But, yeah. 
I have no problem with that. Cool. And I know it, God knows. So. Yeah, yeah you'd, be, right you'd, you'd, you'd have a lot of personal yeah. and then yeah. put it in there and then be like, oh, this is Jack's kind of story about what he did for a year <laughs> and, and such. One thing I learned, and I knew you were a book agent before you became an author, but at the convention today, you had all these pictures of, of all these different uh, radio, uh, sorry, um, radio rock, and uh, rock and roll stars or whatever, and you worked right. for rock and roll magazines before. Yeah, I, I did a lot of work for Cream out of Detroit. Okay, what's, what magazine? I'm not familiar with that. Uh, so it was... Uh, a guy came to the table today and he said, you know, where'd you get these? And I said, well, uh, I did the rock and roll gig. And he said, who'd you write for? And I said, well, Rolling Stone and Cream. And he said, ah, Cream was much better. And he was right. Uh, really good critics came out of Cream. Nick Tosh has come out of Cream. Um, Lester Bangs came out of Cream. And if you know rock and roll criticism, you know these names. Uh, and they were, they were, they were really... Those were the days we actually could write literature about rock and roll. It wasn't just studio flat shit that they would hand you and say, here's the publicity packet, write it for me. How many uh, years did you do this? When I left Scott Meredith, I wrote for about three years, three and a half years for magazines. And so it was about, about three and a half years. And did you go to a lot of, I mean, what? Did, uh, Went to a lot of shows. Shows, yeah. Yeah, I got a lot of, in the old days, it was kind of fun because um, students would send me everything. Uh, all the uh, uh, Electra would send me stuff, Arista would send me stuff. And there, would, there was a guy who used to come around every week uh, with a truck, and he knew who all the critics were in New York. And he'd come around with his truck, and he'd say, what don't you want? And so we'd sell him our albums that we thought were shit for like a dollar or two dollars a piece. And we made, I think, as much money on those that we as we did on the paychecks from the actual magazines. Because, you know, you write a piece of rock criticism back then, you got 50 bucks or something. Even if it was Rolling Stone. It was really cheap, real small money. But uh, we'd get maybe 50 bucks for the leftovers that we didn't want. And then my collection of LPs just grew enormously during that three-year period. So it was kind of fun. I still got them, most of them. I have a small box of LPs, and I've only recently, in the last few years, started getting into collecting LPs, but I've been very picky about it. And there's been a couple great companies like Mondo and Waxwork Records that put out uh, original 1080p vinyl uh, soundtracks based off the original Master Cut, Mm, and they're mm -hmm. huge collector's items, Mm. and they're really hard to find sometimes. You know, once they go out of print on the website, that's it. They're gone, huh? Exactly. Um, you know, and they're putting them out for movies that either Denver had they uh, like a vinyl soundtrack or they did years ago. Like they put out a uh, a Dokken three and a half inch vinyl for uh, Dream Warriors from the Nightmare on <laughs> Street Part Three for the twenty fifth anniversary. Neat. Yellow and and uh, sold out completely, but I found one for twenty two dollars. A little on yellow eBay. record, huh? Yes. All right. Uh, I have sitting in the car right now. We're going to play tonight uh, the soundtrack to Trick or Treat. Uh, okay. on these two like black and orange records. Uh, they're mm. they're they're putting out stuff for like TV series. Uh, TV series sometimes have individual episodes, aren't just playing the same track over and over again. They're actually creating new music for some of these episodes, including yeah. children's cartoons. And they're putting out one for like Batman the Animated Series. Neat. So they're putting all these different scores out, and it's going to be in this like one hundred and fifty dollar box set of only six tiny little records. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's fun. Only like two or three minutes a piece. So you got to be the hardcore collector to be yeah. spending one hundred and fifty bucks on a total of probably 10 minutes of music <laughs> <laughs> oh man so when you leave here we'll take you a tour through the uh the record room of the wcw okay WCCD. cool all you right pull some stuff out good um uh, did you uh would would that be something you ever want to like get back to or is it like once one and done and then yeah it's done i don't need to write reviews anymore i, and I also i was a cranky reviewer um i only reviewed stuff that i liked <clears throat> my my feeling was that if i there was so much to criticize in the world I didn't want to criticize art. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, essentially what I said, my stance was I would, I would take a piece that I liked, point out where, where it might be um, flawed, but I wouldn't write the review in the first place if I didn't actually like the record. And I think that was a stance that I liked. I also had the same stance about re- uh, reviewing books. Same thing. I don't want to piss on artists. Gotcha. I'd rather piss on politicians. So. <laughs> The how what years did you do the, the 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 music reviews? That was from about seventy six to uh, oh wow seventy six to eighty 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 one eighty two. So when you say records, yeah. you really mean vinyl, man. <laughs> yeah, vinyl, yeah, not yeah. CDs. No, not, no, not even tapes. Not even tapes. Yeah, no. still on eight tracks. <laughs> No, I never did eight tracks. <laughs> so it was the records, and then you became the book agent, and then became the yep international well, famous no writer. no it was the book agent first uh, the book. yeah and then it, and then, I, then i went out on my own because i i i knew a lot of uh 
editors by that point because I'd been an agent for three and a half years. So I knew editors among the rock and roll magazines, among the men's magazines, some of the women's magazines, and so I knew who to pitch to, and that's who I hit. Well, you've done a lot of really cool collaborations yeah. over your career. Yeah. Is there anybody that you've always had an interest in working with but haven't gotten a chance? Wow, uh, there are so many good people that I, I could shit. <laughs> I'd love to do a movie with Del Toro. <laughs> Crimson uh, Peak just came out. This I just saw it. It was really good. Did you like it? It's not a horror movie, though. I don't mind. Yeah, it is marketed mind. like a horror movie, but it uh, is not. It is a psychological... Is it a thr- good movie? Yes. It all is right. beautif- it, it's it, all it, I need. It is very beautiful. Yeah. Um, and I thought that the creature effects in it were very cool. Um, I'm going to call Doug Jones on Monday and be like, I saw you in the movie, but I couldn't figure out where you were, and the <laughs> IMDb credit doesn't like list you as a character name or whatever. Where were you in the movie? <laughs> so... I do a collaboration with Stephen King if he wanted. I'd do that in a minute. Awesome. Yeah. All right, we'll get that set up. <laughs> you know him. You should give him a call with Steve. We should work on something together. He's a busy guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The uh, he's got something coming out with his son Joe Hill. I, I don't know if it was a comic book or what it was, but I don't know if it came out yet. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of his too. Met him a couple of weeks ago. It was at a, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, Joe's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. it was at a book re- book festival thing <laughs> that uh. Uh, you know Christopher Golden? Sure. He, well, he, he's an old friend. Oh, he put on a thing in uh, Merrimack Valley, uh, a, like a tiny little book uh, horror Halloween book festival thing in like a play theater. Mm-hmm. Uh, the room was like literally almost no bigger than a studio. <laughs> and you could cram like maybe 50 people in there. Yeah. And then, of course, there was the stage uh, where they performed the plays where they did all the Q&As and, and panels and stuff. Sounds good. Oh, yeah. A lot of fun. Do you have No? No? I mean... All right, get out. No. <laughs> uh, I can ask stupid questions. No, ask long. no, ask stupid <laughs> questions. Ask something fun. Don't just ask it about the uh, the books and the movies. Ask something fun. All right. Well, I guess now is the time to ask if you ever remembered how to fly. Ah, flying. Yeah, when I was a kid, um, I dreamed of flying. I guess so frequently that it was it settled in my brain, not as a dream but as a memory, um, and so that. I recall, I think it was my freshman year in college, um, I was asked about dreams in some respect or some form, and I said, I know how to fly. I know, I know exactly how to do it. I know how to hit the wind and what the tra- trajectory would be. And, and, uh, and I just, I, 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 I did it. Because that's, I had a memory of actually doing it. It was that vivid. And, I got together with Paula in 1970, and I was telling her this, and we were walking on an old country road in New Hampshire. And she said, okay, why don't you try? And I said, that's ridiculous. I can't fly. I never dreamed it again. Isn't that sad? You killed it. Isn't that sad? Yeah. (laughs) You never just try to learn to take it up as a... I don't think it would have (laughs) worked. Uh, when you are getting into the zone to write something, where where do you go? I mean, do you try and like put like silence, uh, silence, yeah, no yeah. music or anything? Nothing, no, no. People yeah. suffer a lot from writer's block. Do you do? You, does that come to you? I don't a lot? believe in writer's block. You don't believe? No, in I think writer's block is you've, you've had too much to drink. Your ladies left you, or you know, you're just depressed or some sort of, some shit. Um, I don't think that has anything to do with writing. It has to do with your personal life. And if your personal life is in, in order, you're not going to have writer's block. If you're a writer, you know, if you're a writer, you're not going to get writer's block. It, okay. some, some other shit's going on. So if your personal life <coughs> is in order or not in order, you will, you will be able to write or you won't be able to write? If your personal life is in order, you're probably going to write. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, at least to the extent it's got to be in order to the extent that you can write. Uh-huh. If you're consumed by uh, worries, doubts, uh, uh, money problems, all kinds of crap like that, that you could call it writer's block but it's really what it is it's money problems or romantic problems or I'm drinking too much I'm taking too much dope so I don't know I don't have writer's block sometimes I'm bored with what I'm writing so I'll stop mm-hmm. but uh, but that's not the same thing either so okay and I um, like as a writer myself I come into my ADD really like screws up my head and I just <laughs> I get so distracted when I'm trying to write and it's like I really need as you said to be like it's gonna be quiet. Mm. I gotta unplug the internet because that 
goddamn thing, especially when we're on a computer, because we all type on computers these days. Yeah. You know, even if you write down on paper, you still got to put it on a computer. Yeah, it's it's computer. the only way, unless sure. you have a typewriter, but you're not going to type it up. You, no one's going to accept a manuscript from a typewriter anymore. No. So you need to unplug the internet, disconnect it, or whatever, so you can't be tempted to go online. But uh, I'm finding a lot of times that... It's a discipline. You apply, ask to chair, and you turn off all the other crap. Yeah. But, of course, then I'm finding, like, oh, I need to research something. i got to go on the internet (laughs) to do it. True, true. And uh, so with people who don't have writer's block but are just not finding focus or whatever, what would you recommend? Who are not finding focus? Yes. So maybe not writer's block, but just... everybody's got different tricks to find focus. Some people do zen. They meditate. You know, some people listen to music. But you just get quiet. I just get quiet, yeah. 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 And if it's not coming, I'll just uh, let it go for a little while. I'm, I believe in, uh, I, I'm patient. I don't try to force things. I, I, when I have a deadline, it's way ahead of deadline. Uh-huh. Words, I won't even accept a deadline unless I know I can really make it easy. Gotcha. Uh, so there's no pressure to perform, mm-hmm. which when I was working for magazines, there often was. It was one of the reasons, of the reasons I started trying to write novels instead because uh, – Deadlines can, for me, make me nervous, and that makes me not write as well. Uh, so um, when I have a deadline, it's way out there, so it's easy to hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah. I had that. Oh, I, I that. believe in a calm. You're supposed to have a sort of a calm to to create stuff. And I did that last summer. I had a deadline <laughs> by um, um, uh, a book, uh, was uh, an anthology I was going to be part of, by Jonathan Mayberry called V Wars mm-hmm. and I set aside every single Friday for like three hours just to get, you know, the, the to the ten thousand words that I needed. Yeah. Uh ten pages and it worked. You know, yeah. it didn't get published. But it worked. You know, I mean I got the thing written and, mm-hmm. and stuff and I was actually surprised that I was actually able to be, be like stick to the plan and do it because otherwise I, I procrastinate a lot and I put it off or I'm like, you know, I write like maybe a half a page. And I've I've noticed like just trying to trying to find a schedule of like you're gonna do this this day and you're not gonna do anything else and mm-hmm. you're just gonna write it and that's it. Yeah. It's, it's particularly rough if you have a job if you if you've got to oh, yes. something nine to five that's really tough. And when I was work, working as an agent, I wrote one novella over three years, you know, uh, but because uh, I was writing all the time as an agent, I was writing letters and crap like that. So cool. Yeah. Well, Jack, we appreciate you taking the time to come out My and, uh, to the studio with us and answer a lot of our uh, questions about your career and your health and, and uh, shoot the shit about you know the, the writing industry and everything else. Sure. I really appreciate it. Um, and you're going to be at the Hawthorne, the, 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 what was it called again? The, the Overlook? The, the Stanley Overlook. Hotel? Yes, Stanley the Overlook of <laughs> the Stanley Hotel. <laughs> the Stanley oh, Hotel. I don't know why I said the Hawthorne. I don't know where that's wrong. Uh, Nathaniel is in your brain, maybe? Yes, <laughs> yes. Th- yes, because uh, some Some gothic came- stuff is floating around your head. <laughs> Somebody mentioned that, like uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne at least four or five times at the con this weekend. Really, really, <laughs> yeah. And then someone come up that often in, in my personal life. I just don't fuck? understand. Again, Jack, thank you so much for coming in the studio with us. We really appreciate your time. Pleasure, thanks and we for, look forward to your. Thanks next, for inviting me. Your next, uh, we look forward to your next book.